Chairman, it's 10 o'clock. I confirm that the live stream is now started. Lovely, thank you. And uh, good morning, um, good morning, everybody. And uh, good morning to um, Jesse and Stuart who are joining the meeting for items later on. Um, I think we, we know we're still waiting. Steve Jeremy's going to call in a little bit later on and we're still working for Mark Goodwin. And I think other than that, the register is uh, complete. So uh, thank you. Um, and I think we'll use, as, as, as Emma said on the, um, as we're setting up, we'll use the hands up, um, but I'm sure between us all, if I miss a hands up or a cross in the box for Phil, um, Carol and Glenn will keep, uh, keep an eye uh, on it um, and to say if we can uh, keep the videos off. Uh, I've been looking desperately for my blur the foreground button, but I can't find it. So my selection of history books are now blurred at the back. Um, so can I just before we um, kick off, I don't think there's any apologies. Um, are there any declarations of interest we need to note? I don't think there should be. Fran? Um. Yes, Chairman, thank you. Just I'd like to declare an interest in anything related to Smart Islands, please. Yeah. Thank you. OK, brilliant. OK, if anything crops up in the course of the conversation, because uh, we'll get we will be talking about some of the funds, then we'll we'll clearly just have to make a check that we uh, declare an interest, but I think we'll be OK. So can I ask people to have a, a look at the minutes and what we'll do is if we can run through them uh, and then we'll just have to um, formally um, accept those or any amendments that we feel we need to make. So if I can, if people are happy. If we can pick us, I think it's pages three onwards in the pack. So if we can just do page by page and yell because I'm multitasking page three. Page four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, doing really well. Page nine, ten, and eleven. Um, Glenn, do you want to, there's, there's no, uh, before we just approve that, do you want to just pick up on the actions and then we'll um, just uh, get a you know, note of form of approval in the minutes? Yeah, thank you, Mark. So um, all of the actions are done. Clearly the, um, th the first one about the risk in relation to COVID-19 is, is being monitored uh, on an ongoing basis by the Audit and Assurance Committee, and that's why uh, it's ongoing, although uh, we have increased that risk in line with the, the second lockdown uh, and what's happening both nationally and locally uh, at the moment. The growth hub item uh, is on the agenda, uh, but just to note that you did write to um, growth hub colleagues. Uh, we have been liaising with Josie on Freeport's consultation uh, and that might well come up in the agenda later on given the publication of uh, Freeport guidance this week uh, and then with thanks to Nathan uh, and Gordon we did submit a response on planning uh, in so much as it uh, related to economic de development and the, the LEPS agenda and the annual performance review the action is done again um, but an update from you I suspect chair in part two of the meeting uh, on the results of that. Perfect. OK, thank you, Glenn. Yeah, we'll certainly pick up on um, on the last points in our private session. And as, as, as we said before, we um, before the, uh, the the recording started, we'll probably just take a break between parts one or two. So having heard of that and looked at the minutes, if people can just stick their hand up if they are happy to approve the minutes and then we can move on. So if you pop your hand up now, that'd be great. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. That's carried by majority. Oh, thank you very much. Right. Um, thank you, everybody, for that. Just by means of introduction, for um, just brings up speed what's going on. If I just have a, a few minutes and then I'll pass on to Glenn, we'll pick up a lot of the, the details. Um, it, it has been sort of over the last um, 
since we've met formally and informally, it's, it seems that we've got a split board of people who are uh, working very hard on the day-to-day -day alleviation of what's happening with COVID and uh, and the state of the economy at the moment, and uh, a number of people working very hard on helping us define what the future Cornwall will look like, some of which is very clear, like floating offshore wind. Uh, some of it has become uh, less clear, uh, and there's lots of work happening around that. So, for instance, defining what our um, visitor economy should look like in the future, and we'll pick that up later on. Um, people will be aware that the um, Comprehensive spending review that we're due for next week is now a one year mm -hmm. statement. Um, and I think happening on the 25th. That has a number of implications. One very parochially, we still haven't had uh, um, confirmation of our funding for next year, which is a, uh, a not an unusual situation for them to find themselves in, but it's, it is frustrating and it isn't right. And we'll no doubt pick that up uh, later on. Uh, I think probably more significantly, the UK Share Prosperity Fund. Uh, has sort of slipped back a little bit and there's two concerns from where I am on that is one is the uh, potential gap that there could be on dis uh, the, um, disconnect between where we are now in funding streams and, and programs and um, what might follow it as we uh, uh, as we settle down in our post Brexit world um, uh, and the other risk that what might uh, not risk or sorry opportunity or risk is that we might end up with a um, another very quick call to arms in terms of um, uh, intervention from UK government for business development, such as the um, getting building funds. So with that in mind, you know that we have asked for expressions of interest uh, and lots of conversations are going on with, with people coming forward uh, with work that they want to do. Uh, and I think the colleagues know that we've sort of continued dialogue and working with um, people who, who we um, uh, who we built that relationship up for the first getting building funds. So I'm hoping very much we'll have a uh, that, that if if there is a short sharp call to arms that uh, we are uh, hate that expression as shovel ready as we can be um the devolution agenda has also slipped back a little bit uh which again i i'm concerned of in terms of um the recovery of our economies um i think it's very important that we do achieve an improved devolution um deal, particularly around the allocation of future funding and particularly to me adult skills and we'll no doubt talk about that a little later on. Um, there is a little bit of uncertainty about where we are with the local industrial strategy work. I know we've continued to review ours in light of COVID uh, and there's quite a lot of work happening particularly through the rural group and energy group in terms of um, what that uh, what uh, that really means in terms of its evolution. So no doubt the conversation will continue with Josie and Sally and colleagues in terms of um, how this process will pick up, but in the meantime, we are, um, we are reviewing it and we will keep it and, uh, as the basis of um, uh, discriminating between interventions that we might want to make. Um, really welcome the government's focus on green recovery. Um, lots of pictures of floating offshore wind in reference to heat pumps, uh, which is all really encouraging for our aspirations uh, for what we want to happen in terms of our recovery in Cornwall. Um, what is really frustrating is that there is no particular reference to either Cornwall or the Great Southwest in terms of the opportunity to lead the Great Southwest. Indeed, there's a positive discrimination towards um, uh, devolved nations and uh, our Red Wall constituencies up in the north of England. So we need to work hard with our MPs and political colleagues to inside and outside of Cornwall to um, to make sure we're not lost in that. I don't believe we will be, but um, we need to make sure that we're not. Um, we we'll continue to work on the Adult Education, uh, New Employment and Skills Board, which we'll no doubt talk about a little later on, but that's so important. We've seen the unemployment figures deteriorate, not to the degree we thought, uh, thank God, um, but we do know there's going to be a significant issue in terms of employment. We know in terms of um, people's indebtedness, there'll be particular places hard to hit, uh, and we know behind all that there's a rapid pace of change in terms of how we all live our lives and emerging industries. So that whole skills agenda, helping people into work and, and being fit for work uh, is, is going to be a real priority next year. And I think also the delay in devolution will probably gives us some opportunity to keep talking to government about if there's going to be a, a pan regional entity that's you know, beyond Cornwall to Scilly, is it going to be the Great Southwest? Is it going to be a bigger area? Uh, I know there's been lots of uh, discussions around that inside and outside of Cornwall. Uh, certainly a willingness to work with the Western Gateway on energy and zero, um, net zero and, and transport, but thereafter our economies are very different. And 
any sort of conjoining of the two areas does seem to be a step too far and I would worry that Cornwall's voice will be completely lost. But we have an opportunity now of hopefully hopefully working with the rest of the private sector and LEPs and, and councils to clarify what would be best if there's something that sits aside from the left area. Um, we welcome Josie today to, uh, Jesse today, sorry for the, uh, Jesse, to the uh, meeting. Uh, Jesse's going to talk through the work and consultation they've been doing around what Cornwall should look like in the future and in that conversation we'll clearly um, look about how that aligns and um, to the work we've done around our local industrial strategy. Uh, so welcome Jesse. Uh, we've also got Stuart Anderson uh, joining us from the Growth Hub. Um, I just want to say thank you. We've, we have written to Stuart, but the Growth Hub has been a really active part of the business cell, which we um, we chair and lead, working with other representative groups, uh, Bishop Business Bank, and um, has shown really the invaluable role of, of Growth Hubs and People Hubs in the environment we're in at the moment, and uh, um, has gone around, has, has done an excellent job uh, extending its reach. So thank you, Stuart, on, on behalf of it. And it's nice to see that all those representative groups from um, very different areas are working very cohesively to try to understand what's happening and um, advise and intervene uh, when necessary. Um, really pleased, some of the, uh, the council asked that same group for some advice on the additional restrictions fund, which was given uh, feedback from the representative groups. And I'm really pleased that monies this week have been paid, then I'll probably pick that up. And again, I think that puts Cornwall in the leading tranche of authorities so um, from the private sector to uh, council colleagues thank you for that I know people will be very relieved to see some money hit their account um, a just particular thank you to Claire again the rural group is particularly active at the moment um, we have um, Brexit's really taken the backstage at the moment but for the rural economy it, it could be very significant um, in terms of implications on migrant labour the, the new Elms trials, the, the Agricultural Agriculture Act, uh, and also um, colleagues have been working very hard, uh, Steve and Claire, to bring the fishing community into the sort of rural group on a more consistent basis, because I think post Brexit, there'd like to be particular challenges. So, um, and that group is also now working with um, with Nathan, with Visit Cornwall, with higher education colleagues uh, to put a straw man together about what a sustainable regenerative visitor economy should look like from the economic point of view, from the environmental point of view and what message do we need to send to our potential customers, be they visitors, customers from the UK or, or beyond and what all that put those together. So an important piece of work which will be fed into um, the Liz and will be something we will talk to colleagues. We're already talking to colleagues from uh, different um, walks of life in Cornwall as well. Um, that's, that's very important. Um, we've also continued to push really hard with DWP to get all our European ESF monies committed. Uh, we are making progress, it is slow, um, but again, thank you Stacey, Emmy and Francis on that regard. I think we will get there, um, not as quick as we would have hoped, but um, and, and no doubt we'll talk about that later, but um, I think there is progress and I know a lot of people have worked outside and informally of, uh, to try and make sure that happens. Um, Steve isn't with us at this moment in time because the Strength in Place is big, it goes live very soon, uh, into next week. Um, and that's significantly, uh, hugely of significance for um, uh, for Cornwall if we can get that over the line. Uh, and there's a lot of work happening around potential supply chains and uh, implications for ports and skills and such like. Uh, and also Steve's like, wrapped up with the wave hub sale, which is all integral to it. So he will join the meeting a little later on and no doubt update on on that piece of work. Um, the uh, our investment fund, COISIF, has reached an important landmark. I'm not going to steal John on Glenn's Thunder, but uh, John and um, co have, have uh, got some real momentum behind that and we'll pick that up later on. But thank you very much. That's significant money is going into the Cornish economy uh, and come back into the Cornish economy later on. Uh, and finally, I just want to say thank you for all the work that's been done around the communication agenda. I think the, um, I think the communication from and to the left has hugely improved over recent times certainly feel we've got uh, the right tone, we've got the right relevance and increasing reach. Uh, and I know Katie and Jason have been involved with that, but I think behind the scenes very quietly, Poppy's working very, very hard uh, with uh, uh, with those colleagues to make sure that we are presenting ourselves in a better way and receiving um, you know, our ears and uh, mouth are both open as it were. So thank you very much for all of those. Um, and as the last board meeting, just want to thank everybody because there's been a huge amount of work happened um, uh, formally and informally since the last board and I know lots of colleagues have been working 
uh, very hard. So I'll finish on that. Um, unless there's any questions, I can't see anything coming up. I'll pass over to Glenn. Thanks, Mark. That's really helpful uh, in terms of uh, setting the strategic scene. I think you've covered uh, a lot of the strategic issues I was going to raise. So I will give my um, update a bit more of a operational feel. Um, and hopefully just talk board members through what I think are the key things in quite a, a long set of uh, chief execs papers this month. So obviously since the last meeting we have um, entered into a, a second lockdown. At the last board meeting we were talking about catching up with the uh, agreed business plan of the LEP and some of the things in there. Um, because we've gone into a, a second lockdown uh, we haven't been able to pick up the pace on some of those things, um, particularly because we have been focusing uh, mainly through Mark's efforts and Mark's chairing of the, the business cell. We've been focusing on working with partners, the FSB, the Chamber, Visit Cornwall and a whole range of others, um, not to mention the, the two local authorities on um, kind of managing both the intelligence and the lobbying around uh, the impacts of the, the lockdown, but also some very practical things. Mark talked about the uh, grant payments, um, the LEP business partners uh, and local authorities worked really hard to get those schemes up um, as quickly as we possibly could. They were launched uh, last, the mandatory scheme was launched last Friday. Um, the additional restrictions grant will be launched later today. Um, and I know Cornwall Council has already been able to get uh, around four million out of the door. So uh, when we entered the lockdown, uh, we were kind of assessing what's the most practical, helpful thing we can do for businesses, shaping that those business schemes and, and helping get the message out that they were up and running um, was put very much at the, the top of our priority list. Um, the impact of that, as I say, is some of the, the kind of core things on the business plan have slipped. Uh, and we'll have to wait to see um, what happens at the end of the current lockdown, whether we go back into a tiered system before I can really advise on um, what we might have to think about pushing into next year in terms of actions and, and spend and what we can realistically catch up on. Um, but I think that reprioritization of let resource and time and effort has been really worth it. And, and certainly with businesses waking up this morning, having been paid. I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, and as Mark said, all credit to Cornwall Council and the local authorities uh, for getting that up and running. Um, so practically in terms of the LEP um, risk profile and finance, what all of that has meant is that with slippage on delivery of the um, business plan, core items, the spend profile is still pretty much as it was last uh, time we met, so slightly behind um, schedule uh, and we'll have to see whether we catch up or not. We're also because of the second lockdown reappraising some of our uh, risk issues. So we have increased the program risk. Uh, obviously we've increased the, the COVID risk as I said earlier, but we've uh, also increased the program management risk and that is particularly around things like growth deal, things like getting building fund programs where, are, where there are some generic issues, so we don't know yet, uh, although the team are working hard with our um, partners, and our delivery partners, um, we don't know yet quite what the impact of the lockdown will be on things like construction, supply chains, uh, where uh, growth deal builds uh, are still happening. And we've talked about this a lot at the Investment and Oversight Subcommittee. We did have a plan in place for managing that, um, before the second lockdown, but clearly we're going to have to review all of that and that's why the risk has gone up. There are also some specific risks caused by COVID and the second lockdown uh, within our delivery program, particularly around projects which have been directly affected. So in our growth deal, there is a investment into Spaceport. Um, the position on that hasn't really changed since the last meeting in that uh, Cornwall Council for reasons we've discussed and understand have moved funding from Spaceport to the airport um, in order um, to make sure that that facility and asset um, keeps going in, into the future. Um, but that does potentially 
if it's not resolved either by local government or national government, create a risk in our, in our growth deal programme. As I said, that's very much a um, holding pattern at the moment. We're hopeful that that will be resolved shortly. There is a um, comprehensive spending review announcement next week. I think we hope it will be resolved then, um, but that remains to be seen. Um, thinking a bit more positively, um, although there has been delays, there are things that we've been focusing on, particularly um, around delivery areas. So we have made a lot of progress with the getting building funds, despite what I've said about the, the risk profile. So uh, we have contracted two projects that were announced as part of the getting building fund. Uh, and the two we've contracted are the uh, Truro and Penwith Skills Centre in Bodmin and the Hall for Cornwall. Um, and the rest are probably days, maybe a week or two from being signed. So we've made a huge amount of, of progress on that. Uh, we've also, as discussed at the last meeting, opened up an expression of interest uh, process for local projects to come forward. We hope um, to be in the next round of Share Prosperity Fund or Growth Deal, whenever that uh, is. We did exhaust our, our pipeline of projects uh, in funding the Getting Building Fund. That's been going really well. We've had a lot of interest in that. I think we will have a compelling um, and large list of potential projects, both um, public and private sector led. Um, but because of the lockdown, I'm minded to extend the deadline on that by a couple of weeks. It was due to be the end of November. Um, but I think if we can extend that for no objections uh, around the board, we should do that just to make sure we're capturing those projects that have perhaps um, had other things to deal with uh, during the lockdown. Also making some progress operationally, reviewing how we, uh, Mark kind of trailed this, how we um, deliver our communications. At the moment, we have absolutely redirected all of our communications to um, signposting where businesses can find support. Uh, but we're also going through a website rebuild at the moment, which I know Poppy has been inputting on um, quite extensively, and we're hopeful that will be completed in February. Uh, as Mark said, we, we've been doing a lot of uh, lobbying and um, trying to articulate our vision around a couple of areas that the board have set a priority, primarily uh, low carbon, but also sustainable tourism and uh, articulating what that means in terms of a further iteration of the local industrial strategy and that will be coming back shortly so thanks to Claire in particular uh, on that um, and then I think the final thing I was going to say is we have made a lot of progress on recruitment of new non-exec directors um, particularly to fill the gap left by Louise um, and we're interviewing next week for that so we've done quite a lot of work on recruitment as well I think, Mark, unless there was anything else you wanted me to cover, I was going to leave it there. Thank you, Glenn. Before I just pass on, I know Gordon's uh, got his hands up. Um, if people on the expressions of interest, we we particularly want um, we particularly want to know about those that um, uh, that align to local industrial strategy. That that given our current state of our economy, we, we can get going quickly, but we're also encouraging people to have a general conversation with us. Um, the government's talked about clean recovery. There was announcements around defence, which again didn't reference anything in the South East, South West, which is uh, worrying. Um, but we're also talking about um, other schemes to make sure we've, we've uh, cast our net as broadly as we can do. So if there are other opportunities to come ahead. And Francis, we work, we, we, we have met the South East Cornwall um, uh, councillors now to, to so we've again so if, if colleagues uh, can sort of keep that in mind and um, talk to either businesses or um, or councillors or whatever it happens to be in your areas um, please do. Um, Gordon I think your hand was up first. Yeah thanks Mark um, that's an impressive list but there was a bit of a theme in both of your presentations around government um, failing to provide information government deadlines slipping, um, most notably government not confirming the LEPS funding and obviously that's miserable for the for the team um, for their employment situation but uh, um, we are making forward commitments um, uh, and, and, and rightly so but 
rather parochial concern on my part, we've got responsibility as directors to assure ourselves of our going concern status. And um, I'm starting to worry uh, that we're that we're going to be nudging up against whether we can safely say that. So I, I would like to hear something, please, about what the um, what the consequences are and what the timings are of decisions that will need to be taken about about shutting things down if the government continues to fail to provide us with with funding information. Thanks, Gordon. Um, I'll get Glenn to come back to it. I know this is something which is sort of which is front of mind uh, for people who joined the lab recently. This isn't a new situation. We lurch from this too often year to year and we have to, uh, as, as Gordon said, sort of allude, sort of plan was it prepared to stop and planned, prepared to go, but, planned, but prepared to stop at the same time? Um, so um, it, it, we haven't had anything, neither have, but saying that, neither have we had any um, uh, concerning noises from government. I may get Tracy to come back into it, but Glenn, do you want in terms of the here and now, do you want to just pick up on the work that you guys have been looking at and then maybe um, ask Josie to come in and see if she's got any further intelligence on timing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I think uh, Gordon's absolutely right to raise this and it may be something we come back to as well uh, in part two under the, the financial uh, report. But I think, um, so overall, I agree with Gordon. It is difficult to plan with uh, government making one year financial settlements uh, for LEPs across the country, it's not just Cornwall and Arles silly, but this is an issue that I know is regularly discussed by LEP chief execs and the LEP network. So it is an issue. What also is an issue is that not only is it a yearly allocation, not multi-year, um, it's often uh, notif funding is often notified to LEPs very late in the year. So last year, I think I'm right in saying that we didn't hear that we had funding for next financial year uh, until February, March time, which obviously makes it very difficult. Um, so I'd be raising that issue if I was a, a board member as, as well. Um, what I would say is that having looked uh, at the accounts very carefully, uh, both with our accountants and auditors, but also Cornwall Council as accountable body, um, we are very clear that at the moment the LEP is a going concern, and that's primarily because um, we have put in place a contingency fund to cover some of those uh, costs that would uh, land on the LEP should we be in a, in a winding up position. Uh, and, and that's something that board members quite rightly asked us to put in place towards the end of last financial year. So that, so that reserve is in place. Um, we also have had Cornwall Council funding confirmed for next year. So the, um, the cumulative impact of those two things means that we can be confident in saying we're a going concern. Um, but you're quite right, Gordon, it doesn't help planning. It doesn't give confidence to staff. Um, and it is a, a re repeating issue year on year. So um, uh, it is something we, we raise with government uh, at every review, every end of year review, every mid year review. Um, I know uh, local colleagues, Josie, are, are sympathetic to that. Um, but it is an ongoing issue. Um, however, on, uh, at the moment, um, I can assure the board that we are um, a going concern. I appreciate the answer, but I can't help noticing that, that we get criticised for um, for the relationship with Cornwall Council by the government <laughs> and, and it's Cornwall Council who are paying their bills. But anyway, I do appreciate the reassurance you give. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Josie, I don't know if there is any update you, you, you can give or or that's different to the conversation? Um. I mean, there's not a huge amount to add, Mark, but you need to say that um, obviously we're eagerly awaiting the spending review on Wednesday, which as you've rightly said is a single hit. Um, you know, we would like to be in a position of offering multi-year settlements as well. Um, and, you know, just for, for many reasons, we are in the position of having to do a single year spending review once again. Um, and we hope that within that, um, spending review, single year spending review on Wednesday, we should get some signals around um, uh, UK Share Prosperity Fund and also uh, future funding plans. So uh, there's little I can say before before Wednesday, but just to to, to sort of repeat what, what Glenn said, this is an issue that we as area leads um, 
across the whole of the country are, are, are sort of escalating internally on behalf of that. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and what we might do uh, from Wednesday is we'll probably just send a note to all the board just to say um, to, to update on what's in there and what isn't in there. Um, Claire, you've got a hand up. Hi, um, thanks, Mark. It was, it was a simple thing, really. Re reference the expression of interest for projects. Um, could board members have something sent round in a format we can send out more widely to our networks to just push that, please? I'm sure we can. It would be um, Glenn, Nathan. I just wondered about um, uh, a format for that because um, some of the key issues around sort of planning, preparedness, match, and all that sort of thing. Is there a, is there a format? I must be one because we're assessing them against it. Yeah, there is a there is a format, um, Mark. I will take that away as an action. We'll circulate something to board members along with the communications about extending the deadline. Um, so that board members are able to, as Claire says, make their um, networks and contacts aware of, of that, because at the moment it's shaping up to be a really good um, set of projects that we're seeing come through. And the stronger we can make that, the better chance we have to be to get those, you know, shovel ready projects ready to go as soon as we get some announcements from, from government. Um, so take Claire's point on that. We'll make sure board members are able, have got the information to champion and communicate that. Yeah. OK, thanks, Glenn and Claire. And I think given the um, given how dynamic um, things are in the government at the moment, that, that's why I would also not just those which are ready to press to go button, but just make sure that we haven't missed, particularly against local industrial strategy priorities that we've already established. If there are conversations with businesses or uh, communities or whatever that we need to be having to have them, um, but be very careful about the communication of it because um, people don't always understand the timescales if we have another shovel ready call. Um, thank you all for that. Is there any other comments on, on Glenn's paper? Because we have covered, it does cover a lot of ground. I think Claire, that an old hand, yeah. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, um, if there isn't any more, uh, Claire, is that an old hand still? Yeah, perfect. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so thank you, Glenn. Um, appreciate the amount of um, uh, work that uh, the team is uh, is doing, and uh, it is you know it's quite frustrating times at the moment. But I think um, there's an awful lot of work being happening. So can I um, uh, pass over to uh, Nathan and Glenn to introduce Stuart uh, and update everybody on the work of the Growth Hub? Thanks, Mark. Um, I think from my point of view, uh, Louis was going to intro the oh, item sorry. as chair of the um, steering group. I, I think um, just while well, you've given me the floor, um, I, I think what I'm hoping for from uh, this item, this will probably be the first of a couple of items over the next uh, few months and, and years. So Growth Hub has made huge progress over the past um, couple of years since it's been established. Uh, it, in terms of being the, the kind of one stop shop signposting for business support, which I think was really needed um, given the amount of business support that is out there. And I think it's proved itself and continues to, to prove itself both in terms of the response to COVID, but also uh, wider productivity advice to, to businesses. But at some stage, um, we, we need to face the fact that a lot of the business support products in Cornwall are uh, and Silly are um, funded by EU funding, um, Growth Hub is no different. So, so I think this is a good opportunity to get under the skin of what Growth Hub does, the, what's currently available, with a view to perhaps uh, a further item as we go forward uh, on restructuring the business model, focusing what we might want to do on the Share Prosperity Fund, uh, and understanding what skills and capability we might need to put in place. Um, the LEP uh, is a key part of shaping what the Growth Hub does, both through commissioning of uh, funding from Bayes, but also uh, local funding as well. Hopefully I haven't stolen Louis Thunder, but I, I just think this will be something we need to revisit over the next uh, few months. So this is a good place to start. Absolutely. Louis, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Glenn. 
Yeah, I think as, you know, as Chair, as Glenn says, of the uh, Management uh, Board of the Grave Hub, you know, I think I really want to just say I really welcome the opportunity um, for the, the LEP Board to take a moment to, to recognise the good work that the, the Grave Hub does, not only in kind of, shall we say, normal times, but um, you know, in, in, in the emergency, <clears throat> you know, economic times such as we, we face ourselves. I also, you know, want to personally, you know, thank Stu um, you know, and, his, <coughs> and his team for the response to, you know, COVID-19. It goes without saying, you know, they were under extreme pressure um, and they really were, you know, a lifeline, you know, someone they could uh, work where businesses and, and people within businesses, you know, can, can go to um, in, you know, very worrying, anxious times. So, you know, uh, you know, I applaud, you know, what, what they've done um, and they really have shown themselves to be an exemplar in these times, you know, for <clears throat> for other uh, growth hubs, you know, ac across the country. So, um, so yeah, so Stu's going to provide a, a take and deal outline um, from the activities, uh, you know, of the growth hub and, and, and skills uh, and skills hub. But um, the, the the, the activities are a mix of funding from the LEP, MHCLG, uh, EU and BASE, you know, sport businesses across um, you know, Cornwall and Arzacilli. And, um, but I, you know, picking up on, on Glenn's comments, it is worth highlighting that you know, the business support landscape is ever evolving. Uh, there is a lot of um, uncertainty ahead with closure of you know, even support, um, you know, uncertainty around you know the replacement domestic you know offering um and you know, the the growth hub management board are increasingly focused on um what opportunities are out there uh, including national programs um, and just trying to work out what the future business support lands landscape will look like so um there's clearly lots going on um and i think uh, i'll now pass over to uh Stu to give his presentation and hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for some questions to be raised by the board Thank you, Louis, and uh, morning, everyone. And and firstly, thank you for for the support from the board and from Mark and from Glenn. Um, really, really, you know, it has been a really busy time. So, 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 thank you. I mean, support. I know I've passed on to the team, and we're all very, very grateful for that. Let me, um, uh, if I can just share some slides. Can someone confirm you can just see the slides? Yeah, you can, Stuart. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to pick up on a couple of, of, of the points um, from Glenn and from Louis, and really just give a an overview of, of where we are now, um, sort of what we've been up to over certainly over the last six months, and also just just touch on the future and some some potential challenges that we have. Um, so if I just this is probably the best way to describe it. I mean, a lot of people will describe the growth hubs in general as a bit of a, a funnel to business support. But this gives us sort of out, an outline really of where we are. So uh, when growth hub started, we were um, ERDF, so we were the green bubble there, um, an ERDF project uh, and, and quite a linear project. And I'll come back to that. Whereas now really we are um, a collection of a, of a number of projects that sits under the brand of the, the growth and the skills hub. So from the growth hub, um, we then commissioned the skills hub, which operated on the same model, um, slightly looser in terms of the amount of time we spend with businesses, but on the same principle of um, doing the diagnostic or the TNA and brokering in support where needed. And so we've been able to share things like a common CRM. Some of the staff are shared across um, both and even, even doing things like that is can be a challenge when you're dealing with, with, with two funding streams. Um, but it's really great that we're able to do that. So in all intents and purposes from there, a business calling in really doesn't see what you know the wiring. So we're all about hiding the wiring if you like. So as we've moved on over the years um, and certainly uh, going into EU exit, going into Brexit, um, we were given some additional funds for uh, Brexit last year, which we had to action very quickly with some activity. Um, and and it, that was mainly around uh, kind of boots on the ground, if you like, and providing um, a route for businesses to get more information, particularly signposting to government information. And then from there, we've gone on now to have some, uh, this year we had some additional uplift money from um, Bayes for uh, business resilience around COVID. Um, 
we've got some additional EU uh, funding, so, sorry, some additional uh, EU exit funding coming through, which has been confirmed now. Um, we've also delivered the ERDF Kickstart grants, um, which you, you, I'm sure you would have seen, which was which was a real challenge to uh, deliver quickly. Um, and obviously over the top, we've, we've still got things like the Cornwall uh, Business Awards. So we've gone from an ERDF project to a, a family of sort of multiple projects, if you like. And then we have links into um, the People's Hub, which is uh, another CDC project with a hub idea. Um, and um, the manager of the skills hub went on to manage the people's hub so we've obviously got great links there within the same family um, and we've also got at the moment some additional uh, money from Bayes for the peer-to-peer uh, -peer project which is um, is managed sort of jointly between Nathan and I really um, and that was an external commission to deliver cohorts of action learning sets up until March so um, lots and lots of projects within the family just, and I wanted to sort of point out some of the support that runs alongside that in terms of our operation. So we are also the cluster lead for the Southwest Peninsula cluster. So now Bayes deals with growth hubs on a cluster level um, rather than 38 individual uh, growth hubs. So Cornwall is the cluster lead for the heart of the Southwest and Dorset, which means we have a, a weekly call with all the 10 cluster leads and, uh, and Bayes, but we also talk to the, the cluster every week as well. So Nathan and I do that, um, which means we have a lot more collaboration uh, and a lot more intel really. So uh, the, the, the growth of, so I still lead the business support delivery board, which is a sort of mechanism to talk to the, uh, the organization leads who are running other business support projects in Cornwall. Um, so we share uh, intel and, um, you know, and, and down to the level of how we refer people into those projects at so close working relationships. And also our communication manager in the same sort of um, method leads the communications group. Uh, communications are quite key to business support and, and developing a business support ecosystem, if you like. So we lead the communications group with, with those similar partners as well. And what has been really useful for us, um, and, and Mark mentioned the partners, was this business cell uh, that we have now on a Monday in terms of um, partners on a call with Cornwall Council. Mark obviously leads that and that has been really, really useful for us. I think, um, you know, I've, I've sung its praises before, but very, very useful to get immediate intel, share ideas and air common problems. Um, and that has been fantastic in terms of how to deal with COVID, but also to talk about recovery. So that just gives you an idea of how we've grown really and how many projects now are involved. So just operation pre-COVID, I'm sure you, 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 you may well have seen this before, but it was quite a linear model of business support through uh, an ER, ERDF or ESF project. Um, essentially, business connects with us. We do a diagnostic, uh, initial diagnostic with the person on the end of the phone, essentially, um, with the business navigator. And then dependent on those discussions, they are um, booked in to see a business connector who in the old model would would travel to see that business typically depending on uh, almost on the on the return on investment for us if you like um, support is broken in and then we'd follow up and that was around from a growth point of view the P this P13 output which is a, a, a an ERDF output um, of spending three hours uh, time with the business that was obviously we were office based physical meetings based on the SALSO methodology so we had a tiered system um, where if they were high growth business would see them sort of physically and essentially if they were pre-start or early stage it might be we we did a one-to-many um, uh, uh, kind of session with them where well, they still got individual advice but a lot of the information was provided at one-to-many level. Um, SALSO is, is, is a, an acronym for um, a kind of scale up acronym if you like which is sales ambition, leadership, scalability and opportunity. So those are the things we'd consider in terms of um, time investment with them on a, on, a, on a kind of loose basis. There's obviously lots of travel in that model um, when we were going out to see people. Uh, and like I said, quite, quite linear, linear in what we did. So post COVID or during COVID, during the current times, if you like, we moved to a much more uh, multi-channel model really. Um, so as, as more projects come on board, we have to be able to manage that and manage the engagement and manage what that project's doing. Um, so now there are multiple ways people can contact us, um, web chat, phone, email, Facebook, Twitter. Um, 
any any way really anyway all very busy web chats very busy um possibly busier than the phones actually uh but we still triage people um we still find a route for them and then we obviously still look at the best support methods so we're still very much a signposting and referral organization but i think the breadth of what we deal with now is far greater uh, where we were obviously quite focused on the growth idea now we see a lot more survival um, lots of businesses looking to pivot, you know, change the model in terms of survival. And we talk to a lot of people, unfortunately, about failure now. Um, and that's really been one of the, the, the biggest shifts in what we do is, um, you know, the team, particularly on the phones, having some very, very tough conversations with businesses um, about their sort of dire situation. So, you know, that's something we had to get used to quite quickly. Um, so we changed the operation very, very quickly during COVID. Luckily, we had the tech set up to be able to do that and literally overnight became, um, certainly for a month or so, became very much a call centre um, where we were talking to as many people as we could. Um, not our traditional sort of uh, activity, if you like, of a three hour support at that point, because that's not what people wanted, um, but just get it, hooking people up. Uh, uh, with the support that they needed but actually what we found and what we still find is people just wanted to talk um, and, and talking through their issues and problems was actually a real confidence booster for them um, and knowing that we were we were there and we would go and help them and we had the time to go and look for the support for them so not really linear anymore we've got people coming from all directions and, and disappearing off in all directions to support if you like um, and coming back to us you know uh, much more sort of a circular process or a bit kind of cogs cogs in the machine really um, so the other thing that we have um, because of these various mechanisms of linking with partners is that we tend to be talking uh, to partners a lot more and greater intel so uh, there seems to be more activity now which i think is brilliant of talking to the partners in a forum you know in a sort of uh, online forum if you like which has been very very useful um, and also with some of the funding we've been able to commission greater intel around things like eu exit um, and we are re re required to report a lot more actually so we do a weekly report up to bays um, on you know almost like what the, what, what the word on the street is what we're finding numbers um, and what's going on in the sectors so a lot more data flowing which we know from a base point of view is is helping shape policy uh, and, and you know we've seen that happening so just to give you some quick numbers around covid um sort of you know with huge amount of uh, of activity on the website and that's because we we, we adopted what we call the digital first um uh, method where all of the information that we were signposting around the support for COVID was essentially to the gov.gov website and the reason for that is that was the most current version of the information um, coupled with that Bayes would send through a uh, I think it runs now to about 250 page document about three or four times a week uh, which actually came from the business, National Business Support Helpline with updates on support so much more hooked in on current info but the, the digital first strategy was really to ensure that we were available to talk to as many people as, as we could um, if they needed further help. So basic information, obviously, we just signposted off our website onto the government website, um, which is what all growth hubs were asked, were asked to do. So um, lots of new leads, lots of calls, lots of web chats, but still carrying out, you know, our traditional uh, uh, outputs around business reviews as well. So actually, fairly quickly, people moved into wanting to think about um, recovery and pivot. So, uh, what do they need to do to keep their business alive? You know, go in new directions, new markets, um, and also an uplift in things like skills reviews. Um, you know, while people, particularly people on furlough, are still allowed to train, um, so we were we were still very busy in terms of, of, of skills reviews as well. But just a huge uplift across everything, um, and that's seen nationally. So, so you know, in in line with all the other growth hubs. So what's been really, really good, I think, for the team in, in what has been a busy and no doubt tough time, um, we still collect a lot of uh, feedback from businesses, really important. Um, and, and 
you know some 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 in, in every time i do a, a a report or a claim if you like um you read through the compliments register and you, it just reminds you why you're doing this that quite often we have over this period been a real lifeline for businesses um and we got you know the, these are sorts of messages we get you know we have a stronger chance of surviving covid because um you know even just a conversation with the business really really important um and also oh there we go um, just some examples of, of again, um, case files that we, we, we collect this feedback is really important. Really, I think it really helps the team as well. But you can see on a simple basis, you know, very helpful, loads of information, loads of tips, trying to sort things out for people. Um, and this, the skills of this is a nice one because it's it's finding the things for businesses that they wouldn't have been able to do for themselves. They haven't got time. We know that SMEs are time poor. That's the central facet of a growth hub. We do that work for them. So post COVID, um, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is um, so we we have now got a tool called uh, Bohurst which is a database of um, uh, all registered companies in the UK. Obviously, we look at it from a Cornish basis, Cornwall basis. So, and, and I'm just giving some examples here of, of, of the type of things that we're working on with it, and this is early days. Um, we've always focused on an organic marketing campaign to spread the word far and wide, but also to make sure we're hooking up with the, the hard to reach businesses, um, which I've kind of reported on our success with that before. But it means now we can move to a much more proactive tracking uh, area. So this this graph, the tool actually tracks. Um, so if I put in the hundred, there's a hundred, basically 190 businesses that are being tracked by Bohurst um, because of a growth metric in in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Uh, and this is those companies in relation to their risk of COVID, which is worked out on a couple of indicators. Um, so we can do things like track companies at, at severe risk, make sure we're connected with them, make sure we can proactively approach them, um, which is you know something that we're moving far more into um, because it's really important. It's really important to use tools like this. Um, so we can see just a, on the, the, the right hand side of that graph is obviously as lockdown kicks in, more companies are slightly slightly more uh, slightly more risk for some of those companies. So we'll proactively contact them. And this is this is just an example of the sort of thing we can do. Um, and within those companies as well, we can look at there's all sorts of ways you can cut the data, um, but we can look at things like what stage they are um, and, and think about the support they need before we actually go and see them uh, by accessing their record through Bohurst. So we're moving into a much more targeted approach that sits on top of our organic uh, marketing, if you like, we are we're already very busy. Um, we're already, I think, the connectors on the certainly on the ERDF project, three weeks ahead typically, and um, they're booked up. Um, but there's there's other flexibility within other projects where we can we can start proactively targeting, and that's across the growth and the skills hub. Um, so we'll be doing a lot more of this as we go forward and as we go into recovery. So what does the future look like for us? Just very quickly. Um, so we have we, we the ERDF project uh, finishes at the moment at the, the end of September 2021. So next year um, there's likely to be an opportunity to, to extend that uh, with with any uh, with underspend and some uplift. So hopefully we will get to um, the end of the, the, the EU program with that uh, with that um, shift of funds, if you like the skills hub uh, ESF is is due to finish March 2023, so near the end of the EU program. Um, and the Bayes funds, so at the moment we have the funds for COVID resilience, we have some EU funds, and we have some cluster money to run a cluster. At the moment that all runs till March 2020, um, sorry, 2021, sorry, uh, not March 2020. Um, and any more very much depends, which had previously been discussed on the outcome of the CSR. Um, they were looking for a three year growth hub program, um, although that looks like now it's, it's, it will be one year. But, but I'll touch on this as, as I've got a slide on, on, on just a couple of issues. Um, and then we're obviously focused on post EU, as Glenn was saying, um, you know, what is the core service uh, at the moment? From a policy point of view, growth hubs are we've had the high, we've got the highest profile nationally across all 38 growth hubs that we ever have. Bays are really interested. Other government departments are really interested. They've been very impressed about the speed which we were able to adapt. Um, 
all, all, most growth hubs are very fleet of foot. Um, and also tre uh, Treasury are very interested in what we can do uh, because we are, we're, we're efficient and we're obviously locally led as well. So I just wanted to touch on, on, a, on a couple of issues um, which, which I just probably highlight and that is just around um, the flexibility of, of the projects. So even though we get an uplift in funds, it can be difficult to manage, um, particularly because, and we flagged this to base, certainly Nathan and I do this, that as a predominantly EU funded uh, project, ERDF funded project, we can't just use our staff when we get further funding, we can't just map them across. We can, but it's very complex to do that. Um, and it affects outputs on the EU, you know, the contractual outputs on the EU projects. Um, so we've flagged this a number of times to Bayes. Um, and obviously with some of the projects, we need to hit certain triggers for outputs, which during COVID, I think all the projects are probably safe to say, um, I've seen this. It is sometimes difficult to do that when someone just wants a very quick conversation. Um, they don't want to go through a, a three hour or 12 hour type type uh, situation. I mean, that will change going up to recovery, um, but certainly first lockdown, um, it was all about very short, sharp conversations with people to help them out quickly. Um, multiple funds, so the multiple funding, absolutely don't get me wrong, we're very grateful for, for the funds, but it does become uh, almost exponentially admin heavy because most funds don't want the same data. So that means things like our CRM, CRM grows hugely in terms of uh, it, it, it's a hungry beast for data, um, but a lot of time is spent um, on the admin side of, of reporting on what we're doing. Um, and that was something that was flagged actually nationally yesterday uh, was the, the, the Growth Hub national meeting and a lot of a lot of Growth Hubs are saying the same thing, um, particularly when it comes to you know managing some of the EU funds as well. And just as an example, so I've gone from um, my, my the, the way I'm funded um, when we started was just ERDF. And now my funds uh, come from multiple sources and that's to, to enable me to work across the different funds we have. Um, so I have to have an element of funding for every project that essentially we're, we're involved with. So that, that, will, that, that sort of gets quite complicated. Um, just in terms of longitudinal planning, and I know we've touched on this, um, with, with things like Bayes funding, uh, very, very welcome for it. It allows us to do all sorts of things and uh, buy some flexibility for us. Um, but the, the, the funding cycles can be uncertain and the funding amounts can be uncertain. And we've seen that recently with some of the, 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 um, the Brexit funding. Um, and it, it, it's difficult to plan. So at the moment, you know, we're we're only running ahead until March 21 in terms of the, the direct funding we get from Bayes. We're not sure what's beyond that. And obviously from a, a team point of view, um, that brings some problems in terms of recruitment retention, uh, how we how we fit people into projects. So um, I think we all would, you know, we'd all like a, a three year cycle. It would be great to be able to plan that far ahead. Um, and obviously the, the question, the bigger question of post EU funds, what does the core service look like? Um, if policy continues, we, we will have a growth hub, um, you know, but you know, what's the funding mix for that? And, and you know, and then do we, a model we've talked about, I think, since the inception of the growth of back in 2016 is having a smaller core hub with demand led add ons as funding allows, um, which we, you know, we, which we might be involved in delivering or we might not. Um, but that just gives a kind of overview of, of where we are. And, and, you know, the bottom line is we've gone from a, a relatively linear project to a a project with multiple funding streams, multiple activity, which is actually great news uh, for businesses in Cornwall because now we can pretty much see anyone um, for any length of time on their terms, which is really important. Brilliant. So I'll stop there. Smashing, thanks Stuart. I've got one quick question. I know Francis got a hand up and I want to pass them on to Claire as well. Sure. Just from Stuart, just from everyone's point of view as well and, and for Josie um, uh, online, uh, we are very grateful for the Bayes money, uh, the Growth Hub has made a real difference to businesses surviving and doing what they need to do, uh, which as Stuart says is hugely, uh, hugely rewarding and essential, but it has also shown it can work collaboratively and complementary to the representative groups as well. Uh, and I've been really struck by on that weekly call how the, the different parties um, are working very constructively together to extend reach and support each other with um, with training and interventions. But I've got two quick questions for our Francois to Francis. One is, I don't know if you want to comment on any geographical differences that you're seeing across Cornwall in terms of your interventions. And the second question, which I might ask Claire to come back to after Francis, was uh, with Brexit looming, um, 
we've got real challenges in our agricultural sector with fishing, uh, which is one of these uneasy fit things with the growth hub. But I wonder whether that in terms of the, the, the medium term, this might be something we need to talk in more detail with Bayes about is how we flex your resource to support two sectors that are going to go through hugely hugely significant change in terms of their business structure. So could you do the ge geographic one? I'll yeah. just think about that and then we'll get Francis and Claire to come in. Yeah, sure. So uh, geographic, uh, I think that the short answer to that is is not re not specifically no. Um, we we have always been great in terms of the geographical spread that we've had, uh, certainly in phase one. I'm sure you know you would have remember the heat map across Cornwall. Um, and it, it, it's it's very, very even and you know, we do dial up and dial down our comms effort and make sure that people are covering areas geographically. So I don't think we've really seen any any huge difference in that. Um, on the the sort of the fishing, I, I think, you, yeah, I mean, to, just to reiterate, I think the Bayes funds have been absolutely vital in us being able to deliver a more flexible service. Um, which has allowed us to deliver essentially to, to, to make, you know, I, I think go to the partners and really ask, okay, what does your, um, what do your membership want? How do they want it delivered? What's the big problems? So actually I should, I, one of the things I should have said in terms of the, the resilience funding that we, we've got three extra uh, business connectors. So one has a business economy focus, one has an agri focus and one has a, a town focus or well, the town's focus is a little bit more about making sure we're um, we're, you know, we're sort of under the skin of what's going on in the town centres. So, and they they don't have to exclusively deal with those uh, businesses, but it just it's 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 allowed us that flexibility to work with people that we haven't been able to potentially under the, the EU programmes, if you like. So hugely, hugely important. Thank you, Stuart. Francis. Yeah, I've got two things really. Um, Stuart, I chair both the Employment Skills Board and the Priority 1, Priority 2 groups. So I'm trying to um, regroup them as like a supply and demand model. Um, so the newly formed ESB, which I suspect we might talk a little around later, our first meeting is on the 9th of December. I do wonder whether we need to get an update to the new ESB members, because some of them are the old faces that you would recognise, but we've got some really quite exciting new faces on board that probably won't have engaged with the Growth Hub. And effectively, we've probably got a whole load of new ambassadors for you, which is great. Um, the second one for me is the is the PA1, PA2 group. I'm trying to get this more as a supply and demand model again with, with them forming the supply. And I, I chaired that group this week. We have got a plethora of European funded programmes. Um, we still have a challenge getting to those hardest to reach people, believe it or not, even though we've got, I think, probably getting on for 50,000 on the UC books at the moment. But I wonder what we can do differently to um, when your businesses begin to kick off again in a post-COVID world, what can we do probably differently and better to match the businesses and the supply side a little better? So I don't know whether we need to get a meeting with the um, growth hub, the skills hub, the people hub, um, but I think we need to be doing more with the providers who are delivering multiple programmes because a lot of these programmes are commissioned by DWP um, completely out of nowhere. One that springs to mind is the new JETS programme that's just been launched and they're looking to get starts a month for people who are being made redundant or 400 starts a month in Cornwall. Um, and we knew nothing about it apart from the provider thankfully is on our, our group so we get to hear about it. Yeah, just just to comment on that, Francis. So, so um, in terms of linking up, absolutely. One of the things that we've got at the moment, um, and I'm I'm quite happy to do an update at the ESB uh, if if required. But we, so Josh, who did run the Skills Hub, has gone off to run the People Hub now. So we've mm. just recruited a new Skills Hub manager who will start in January. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when it might be good to get everything together because obviously we, we'd like the new manager to be involved in all of the conversations um but just to just to give you a heads up on that that, that that's when they're that's when they're going to be in place so yeah. thank you Stuart. thanks for and i think um 
uh, Francis is uh, busy finishing the um, process of copting one or two people onto employment skills boards here. So we've now got representatives from all our big um, employing sectors, as it were, um, or, or very shortly we'll have. Um, so that'll be a fantastic resource for you to plug into. Claire, I just, it's a bit unfair sort of asking it coming, but one of the things we're wrestling with in the rural group is support for what's happening around the agricultural bill and Brexit and Elms and 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 and. And I wonder if there's anything we need to follow up with Stuart and with Bayes really to say how can we use this sort of resource in that context or is, is that not relevant? Yeah, thanks Mark. Um, I think just the first thing I wanted to say was through the rural group, we produced um, a rural sort of skills paper um, through looking at agriculture, fishing, um, tourism, other sectors. Um, and I think that's that would be quite a useful thing for other sectors to to do as well, because I think it, it sort of brought up the difference between what the industry really needed and what was being provided in terms of skills training and, and so on. And I think it really highlighted some things that might be of use to the Growth Hub and others um, to see how we deliver various options. I think Brexit is a key problem at the minute. I think the fishing sector is quite buoyant about what they're going to have as and all the opportunities they're going to have. Um, whether they get that or not might depend, you know, that they might alter their view of what help they need depending on what actually they achieve. And certainly agriculture is, I think both those sectors are difficult to get at because it's um, making those sectors, people understand that they need help and they need to adapt. Um, and I think that's quite challenging. Um, you know, I think they're probably certainly the agricultural sector are least likely to engage. It's been a, a big help having Chris Godolphin there looking at agriculture particularly um, and certainly we've engaged with that and they're doing a few um, sort of joint things with Chris and that's been very helpful. So um, it, it's just finding those routes to get to those people and, and making them aware they need to change their businesses and they need new skills and training really. Um, and on the environmental land management, we are sort of trying to work at how we can um, get that assistance for farmers in how they adapt and change their businesses to losing the basic payment scheme coming from Europe and looking at new um, payment for public goods. Um, but I think it's a, a big area and it's great to be able to have that contact with Chris and, and the Growth Hub. One of the things we might want to think about, Stuart, going forward is a local nature partnership with aspirations against their devolution agenda and clearly with what's happening uh, with agriculture bills and stuff. There might be something which a more formal conversation should happen with you guys and them um, because they might recreate the wheel uh, in, in some of the things they're talking about uh, to a skill set you've already got. One quick comment from me, I'm conscious of time, is one of the things that come out the business cell and Stuart alluded to it was the very neat is one a lot of the sort of things we talked about and mentioned today we all know about because we talk about very often but still remain a, a mystery to, to too many businesses which is still uh, that basic level of knowledge is still um you know we mustn't assume that everybody understands all the stuff that is in the, the you know that's floating around at the moment but also that basic absolute basic support which something like the skills club can help um in terms of being able to understand cash flow and manage cash flow have conversations with customers and that was um with suppliers or customers or, or debtors or whatever so um that's sort of really that that's sort of been uh, i think laid bare by some of the covid things and there's been feedback from one or two representative groups and uh business coaches and stuff um to sort of say there is, you know, we mustn't um, underestimate that sort of basic handholding that's that something like the Growth Hub can uh, provide to help businesses through because many won't have, well, well, none of us have seen quite this, but many won't have seen times as tough as these before. So, uh, and, I, and I think that's been a learning and it might be a signal for maybe post-European funding priorities that we might need as well, given the nature of our uh, business base here. But uh, we've got a couple minutes. Any more comments for Stuart or for Louis? Uh, before we move on. No, OK, well, thank you Stuart for your time this morning. Thank you for the uh, report, Louis, and we will bring it back because we do need to make sure um, that we've uh, got a sustainable model uh, for this resource because the resource has proved hugely valuable 
um, before COVID and particularly now. Um, so we'll work with yourselves and Bayes and, uh, to try to make the case. Um, John, you've got your hand up, John Kerno. Yes, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, um, morning, everyone. Um, I, I was just going to build on the point you were just making there a moment ago, Mark, actually. So firstly, uh, thanks to Louis and Stu for the presentation here. And it sounds like, um, you know, from the sort of things you've been saying, Mark, and that Stu and Louis set out, you know, this has actually made a difference in a very difficult time through COVID for a lot of businesses. It looks to me like Stu has got quite a lot of information and data there or, or on that and the help that's been given. And just, I'm sure Stu's already on the case, but there's always something in here and making sure that we're bringing together that information and really evaluating the difference that something like this makes. So picking up on the points around uh, whether it's sort of signposting uh, people the support they can get or helping them think about the various contracts and so making sure you you sort of keeping track on the difference it's really making and in, in fact as part of that there probably is something around um, uh, how you then extend that reach to those who perhaps aren't getting access and the difference it could make there as well so just evaluating uh, this seems really important thank you mark Thanks, John. And um, I know Louis and Stu will pick that up, but that might be something we could we have a conversation with you about. So if the evaluation to make sure it's in the right format, answering the right questions. I'd be um, actually delighted to. Yeah, delighted to yeah. yeah, OK, so you can be a critical friend for us in, in that regard. So if we're answering the wrong exam Thanks. question, then uh, then put us straight. Right, well, I'll, um, I'll sort of do my dicky delegation and pass that on to Louis and Stu to pick up. But thank you both and thank you everybody for that conversation. Um, it's, it's really important. So, Jesse, can I... Um, so can I, I think everybody's got their hands down. So if I just introduce the work, I, I think we've um, signposted this work um, before um, and how important it is to have a, a direction of travel and a view about what we want Cornwall to be about and hugely and a hugely important consultation that's um, Jesse and the team have um, been leading. And um, we want to make sure that when we understand it all and we can uh, perhaps test and, and check how the work on our local industrial strategy is fed into it. But there is a, this is one of the more formal parts of our board. So when we get to, and we've had the, the presentation and, and discussion led by uh, Jesse, and if we can make sure we keep some time to make sure we pick up all the comments. And then if you look on the board papers, this will be something we'll ask the board to um, sign up to, accepting that the devolution deal has moved back a bit. So there might be some elements we've now got a little bit more time to to do, but I think if we can to, to test, but I think we want to make sure that the the bulk of this is something that the LEP can stand uh, behind colleagues on and uh, be consistent with government on. So, uh, so if you keep your hands down, we'll pass over to Jesse and um, say, so Jesse, try to leave some time to make sure we um, pick people's brains. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mark, and um, and and thanks, colleagues. Actually, because uh, uh, the LEP's been a, a really active um, player in helping to shape the vision that, that's before us today. Um, we've had a number of informal sessions um, and the quality of the the debate and contributions has been really high. So, um, so huge thanks everyone. Um, I, I think as, as Mark said, and as, as actually some of your discussions today have just served to reinforce um, the impacts of both both COVID and uh, Brexit to come on Cornwall makes um, this a time that's more important than perhaps ever before that we've got a shared vision for Cornwall's future um, as we work together for our recovery and renewal from the pandemic. We know that COVID has thrown some of those big disparities that exist in both health and wealth of our communities into stark relief. Um, and that uh, it, it, you know, to keep making the progress that we're making in narrowing those gaps, we, we need a really, really clear roadmap and plan. Um, we've also seen, of course, and we've talked before about um, the, the kind of power uh, of working together uh, with people and communities and partners that we've seen in our emergency response and um, the this kind of ethos of Gillian Warbath or Together We Can, you'll see is very much at the heart of our approach to renewal, just as it has been in the emergency response. And um, I wasn't planning, we had a really good session, didn't we, um, uh, on the kind of feedback from residents um, who took part in our summer listening campaign on the Cornwall We Want. Um, so, and the, the full feedback report is in your pack. So I wasn't planning to recover that, uh, that ground today. Um, unless there are questions. Um, really today is about making sure that 
uh, the plan, Gillian Warbath, Together We Can, the Cornwall plan, um, which has been shaped by what we've heard from residents, what we've heard from partners, all of the work that's been done on the local industrial strategy, health and wellbeing strategy, other, other pieces of work to bring that together into a, uh, uh, into a fresh vision for Cornwall's renewal. Um, and so what I wanted uh, to focus on today is to make sure that those are shared goals that everyone can get behind um, to guide uh, our work as we um, as we seek to create the Cornwall we want to, together. Um, it's it's worth saying uh, up front um, that we know that at the you know sitting here um, wherever we are sitting in 2020 we we can't foresee. Uh, all of the obstacles that may arise in years to come or indeed all the opportunities that may um, that we may be able to seize to accelerate our progress. Um, so what you have before you today um, is not intended actually to ever be perfect or complete. Um, it's intended to be a plan that we keep using, keep under active review. Um, and to that end, you'll see um, it proposes that uh, a kind of outcomes framework that we can use to support that uh, as an annual review of progress and to keep refining and iterating to make sure we're on the right track. Um, what it is um, seeking to do is to uh, describe and paint a picture of what Cornwall will be like in 2050 with that clear set of shared goals um, so that we uh, we know where we're working to try and get to and we can uh, uh, navigate a way towards it. Um, I know in some of our previous discussions um, uh, uh, you, you've said how important it is that it's clear that this is a multi-agency plan and it very much is. Um, so uh, it, it does draw heavily on the work that's been carried out by the Local Enterprise Partnership to shape our local industrial strategy, and I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, but it's already been formally endorsed by Cornwall Association of Local Councils, the Cornwall and Isles of Silly Health and Care Partnership Senate, the Cornwall and Isles of Silly Local Nature Partnership, um, Cornwall's Council's Cabinet, um, and also by Cornwall's youth MPs, who you'll see uh, commented, this vision places the most pressing concerns for children right at the heart of plans for Cornwall's future, from protecting the environment through to improving mental health, ending child poverty and giving everyone an equal chance of a good life. Um, so there's, there's kind of quite wide uh, partner support for this. Um, and uh, it also has uh, helpfully the backing of Environment Secretary George Eustace, who's contributed a quote uh, to the front of the document, making clear that this vision shows how Cornwall can lead the way in building back better and greener. And um, that, that it continues to, to be considered by partners individually, so by, by this board today and by full council uh, of Cornwall Council on Tuesday. Um, and following that, the plan will come to partners collectively for endorsement at the 11th of December meeting of the Cornwall and Isles of Silly Leadership Board. So that's just to kind of give you that reassurance that it very much is a multi-agency plan and not, not a kind of Cornwall Council product um, solely. Um, it is about working together in that spirit of Gill and Warbath. Um, and uh, uh, we know we can achieve a lot more for Cornwall when we work in that way. Um, in terms, Mark, you, you were interested in kind of how the local industrial strategy um, has informed this work uh, and I hope all members can see there's some really, really strong synergies um, uh, which are deliberate because we've we've built that in uh, to the development of the plan. And um, uh, you'll see in the report that um, it picks out how how some of those commitments are are woven into the plan in particular a creative carbon zero economy is one of the six core themes within the document um, and that section kind of speaks to our focus on growing jobs in the green and blue economy um, and building on our, our kind of skills and uh, um, resources in geo resources um, while also ensuring that we have a really sustainable, high value culture and experience led visitor offer. Um, the local industrial strategy um, focus on agri-food uh, is picked up strongly in the theme of sustainable food, land and seas within the Cornwall plan. 
um, which seeks to capture our aspirations for sustainably produced Cornish food and drink um, to be highly sought after. Um, the, the theme within the plan of education, equality and entrepreneurship you'll see speaks strongly to that shared commitment um, that, that is in the local industrial strategy around a diverse and inclusive workforce in Cornwall um, and around increasing our R&D spend with Cornish businesses um, so that they're renowned for their ideas, ingenuity and innovation. Um, and then, of course, um, in terms of kind of uh, globally significant space and satellite cluster, um, uh, part of the local industrial strategy aspirations, that's again picked up strongly within the, the theme of the Cornwall plan that is focused on a digital revolution for sustainable living. So I really hope you can kind of see how um, how the work this board has led on on, um, on the local industrial strategy has really strongly informed um, the vision before you today. Um, I, I mean, from from this kind of feedback we've had from uh, partners so far, um, the, the plan articulates some really clear goals everyone can get behind, um, such as ensuring that no child in Cornwall has to depend on food banks for nutrition. Um, and we very much hope that we can add the Local Enterprise Partnership Board's support to it today alongside those other partners. Um, the the outcomes framework within the plan um, is something I'd be particularly keen. We've kind of tested this widely. This is what we um, you know what we'll be using to kind of review progress and help us track and make sure we stay on course. Um, uh, that that is um, the the product of a uh, three month research project in collaboration with the University of Exeter um, to identify the best kind of. Cornwall wide indicators to measure our progress, um, uh, but we do want to test those with partners and make sure that you think that they are the best possible Cornwall wide uh, uh, metrics for overall progress um, and, and any feedback on that today would be really welcome because we'll keep um, testing and iterating that to get that right. Um, the um, the section on devolution, uh, I think, as, as Mark said, um, uh, that's a really been a really strong component of this work. Uh, we think the Cornwall plan provides a really strong springboard for progressing um, that devolution discussion with government. Um, it, if it, it, you know, with the backing of all partners, it, it will show that we've got a really a uh, really clear vision for Cornwall's future um, that is uh, shared, you know, informed by that uh, engagement with residents and shared by all partners. Um, it's got that really strong endorsement from uh, George in his capacity as, um, as, as a member of the cabinet uh, 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 behind it. Um, the, what we know is that while partners together in Cornwall do have really significant resources uh, to put behind this plan, um, which uh, which is uh, which can guide how we use it together to get the most from those resources. We do know that greater local control over the powers and funding coming into Cornwall would enable us to go further faster. And as, as board members know, we also heard that really strong message from our residents in the Cornwall We Want campaign that they want more decisions affecting Cornwall to be made by Cornwall. And you'll have seen in the report and, and the LEP's been incredibly strong in that um, dialogue with government um, about how Cornwall can build on our successful devolution track record to secure further autonomy ahead of the devolution and local recovery white paper. Um, as Mark's indicated, that was due out this autumn. Uh, we'd made some really good progress in our dialogue with Simon Clark, um, uh, then Minister for uh, Regional Growth and Local Government um, in his late July visit, in which he'd agreed to take forward a conversation around Cornwall working with government to serve as a blueprint for devolution in not metropolitan areas in the same way as Greater Manchester has blazed the, blazed the trail for devolution to, uh, to core cities. Um, Simon Clark's surprise resignation on 8th September and the the white paper being put back is obviously um, uh, uh, kind of meant that we, as Mark said, have a little bit more time on, on, on that. But um, uh, the work that we've been doing together, I think, puts us in a really strong uh, position to bring forward um, a really, a really strong and compelling proposition 
um, from all partners in Cornwall uh, in, into the new year. Um, you'll see in the report that we've set out and hopefully accurately captured those areas that have come forward from the local enterprise partnership in which you guys have been uh, working up, particularly um, that really important piece around um, the evolution of adult education and skills budgets to support um, to support our people um, into into jobs at a time when that's going to be so important alongside those other aspirations in relation to uh, to our renewable energy potential um, and uh, obviously the shared prosperity funding and a sustainable green visitor economy. So uh, hopefully you recognise all of that and you think that those we've captured accurately, those are, as the right areas that um, that you're championing as part of that devolution dialogue. And um, so that was all I was going to say, uh, Mark, by way of, of kind of introduction to the discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, would, would really yeah. welcome hearing from colleagues. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jesse, and um, we'll we'll take some come see. Um, just I I know these things are very broad, but I think um, having a having a sort of direction of travel and a view for what Cornwall <laughs> would like it to be, whilst the world all around has changed, I think is important. But I'd like to make sure we pick up on the um, uh, on the uh, key things, uh, the actions that may, may come out of it. Um, one sort of question before I open it up, just using my chair's position, is I think on the sustainable tourism aspirations that work is still alive so I think the evolution <coughs> delay is going to be helpful because I think as the more we've looked at what this really means there's, a, there's quite a lively debate about the sort of mechanisms that could and should be employed to make the changes um, that we need to happen so that might be one area where we sort of almost like red circle it we, we, uh, we will want some more devolution in this area but we're not actually quite sure what the right mechanisms are and we want to help with that so a load of hands went up straight away I think I saw Linda's first so apologies if I got it in the wrong order so Linda. Lovely, thank you Mark. Um, Jesse, uh, once again thank you for possibly the seventh time <laughs> I've missed this presentation, um, but Jesse I, I, I think it's a little bit remiss of you to have missed out that the very important overview and scrutiny committee made up of cross parties um, voted recently they were not able to support this document in this particular form and obviously this is cross-party elected members so I just felt it was important the LEP board were aware of that information thank you okay Linda um, uh, thank you um, I'm not sure quite how to respond on that but uh, we'll come back uh, Edwina Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, on that last point, I think the recommendation was not to recommend it, not not to recommend the document to be considered by cabinet um, to to be accurate. Um, I think Jessie has really summed up incredibly well in her presentation today and in the feedback document. Um, it's fair to say that this was the biggest engagement uh, project uh, that the council has ever ever undertaken. Um, I had the pleasure of um, chairing the, the environment that we launched session. Over 200 people were live online and many more people saw it on the recording um, afterwards. So looking through the lens of um, climate change, and the climate emergency and the ecological emergency, it's really fantastic to see that the people of Cornwall um, and the other partners that have responded um, put that really front and front and centre um, and embedding that in our future plans. Uh, I'd like to publicly thank Jessie and her team for the amount of work that they have undertaken. Um, so thank you. Um, and I think it's really clear to me that when there's a shared vision in any organisation, um, uh, that that is stronger and something for all of us as partners to cut less uh, around um, and collaborate around. So I think it's an excellent um, document. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Edwina. Um, uh, Emmy. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, whilst, whilst it's interesting to um, hear how other committees and organisations have responded, I think I'm really clear that 
Um, I welcome the opportunity for you bringing it here um, to the LEP, Jesse, and I'm responding as a LEP director and in relation to the LEP strategy only. Um, uh, just to um, echo what um, Edwina said, I think the consultation was really excellent and I think that the themes that have um, been reflected in the document pick up on lots of the stuff that you heard um, and it felt like a really sophisticated and different conversation that really was a dialogue um, and I think I've said that to you before. I think part of the danger in the process and the many different presentations that you've had to, to give of this document is that sometimes in, in the writing of these things some elements become a little less um, uh, uh, specific or a bit underplayed in comparison to others so I think the focus on the blue and green economy is absolutely there I think there's some really great stuff around inclusion although I would urge a certain amount of caution in pinning real living wage against against en um, ending in work poverty. I don't think you can equate those two things. There's more to it than that. And that isn't me arguing against a real living wage. It's just flagging up that actually the cost of housing is a huge determinant of how much money people have to spend. Um, I just want to flag up a couple of points around culture and creativity. So I think that's the bit that's, that's for me has come out as, as slightly underwhelming. I think you talk about a creative economy, but I think in terms of the LEP strategy, this has been something that's really important to us because of the economic potential, because of the, the rate of growth of creative jobs and the average value of those jobs. So growing at five times the rate of the rest of the economy. Um, in terms of UK, it's, you know, creative industries are bigger than automotive, life sciences, aerospace, oil and gas combined. Um, and these are the jobs that are least at risk of automation and most suited to a dispersed rural um, economy because they're not reliant on big factories or big capital assets. So I feel there's something that maybe needs to come out a bit more in relation to that. And I'm very help, happy to help if there's an opportunity to do that. And then I also wanted to say something about culture and heritage. And I think that's again possibly the bit on page 15 that's been boiled down to something which doesn't quite reflect culture's role in economy, in the economy and society. Um, so I think there's a very strong and um, proven by lots of research, which I can direct members to, um, connection between culture um, and productivity, enhancing well-being, enhancing a sense of place heritage, um, increasing the attractiveness of places, attracting creative businesses which are higher value, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think the bit that worries me is that we've equated culture with tourism and culture isn't just for tourists. Culture is for people living in Cornwall and it plays a really important role um, in their health, well-being and prosperity. Um, and I think there is expertise in the council that can help kind of dial that up a bit um, in the document or any future articulations of it. Thanks, Jesse, and well done for everything that you've done so far. Thank you, Emmy. That's that's really helpful. I mean, I think you know the the, the purpose of bringing this around is absolutely that where where there's further strengthening of the narrative and vision that we have. Um, that, that we can weave that in uh, uh, because we are stronger together, aren't we? So, um, so I think you know, just a suggestion for um, uh, Mark as chair to consider it at the end. I think all of those are very much in line with agreed um, that they're about strengthening the narrative and are in line with with the overall vision. So I'd be really happy to kind of. Uh, if the board were happy to kind of delegate authority to Emmy to agree the kind of final tweaks to the culture um, elements of it to uh, to agree some uh, additional uh, points in the text that could be added ahead of the uh, leadership board on the 11th of December. Um, but I'll leave it to you guys to, to think about the best way of um, of doing that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I... Jesse, I'm, I'm sure the answer is going to be yes, but we've also got a couple more hands up though, so if we can maybe uh, pick up all the comments and I'll uh, I'll try to summarise at the end um, the, uh, the the feedback. I think, I think Tim, your hand was up next. Hello, Tim. Thank you. Sorry, I was just um, I'm, I'm muting myself. But, uh, a few thoughts. Um, 
one of the um, important things about this document, and, and, and well done, Jesse, it's been a lot of hard work, is that it does actually help us in Cornwall uh, with our planning approach. Uh, the planners can refer to this document as um, the context in which we plan for the future in, in literal planning terms. So I, I think that's uh, an important thing to bear in mind. And I think from the left's point of view, that will be something I hope that we will want to endorse. Um, uh, I, um, I just wanted to quickly clarify a couple of things. First of all, on the culture and creative side, we've got our manifesto now, and I'm more than happy to help with those things that Amy mentioned. I don't think there's any problem uh, acknowledging that we have a strong commitment um, uh, as a council anyway, and I hope that that will endorse this to the creative sector and the culture sector. Um, just to, back to Linda's point, um, I think there were some members who found some of the language earlier on this document a bit too visionary, and I think that's been improved and clarified, uh, and it reads a lot better now. Um, it was only six councillors who didn't vote for for it at the time. They didn't come up with anything else. And I think uh, George Eustace, I know, has endorsed it. That's great. Um, and perhaps, Linda, you'd like to let us know if the um, Conservatives are going to vote for it. Thanks. All right, well, let's, um, let's stick to, if we can still stick to the leppy stuff, um, but we'll come back to um, I know David's got his hand. Sorry, David. Yeah, Dave, Dave Warren got your hand up, yeah. Um, thanks, um, Chair. Um, I, there's lots of support and celebrate this in this and there's, there's there's very little to object to and the the going further and faster bit through more devolved powers you know um, make it, making that underscoring that that's great I suppose the, the worries I'd have about it and I'm I am speaking as a that board member I think is the the premise and the status of this and just the limits as long as we understand the limits to the extent we can create this socio-economic microclimate in in Cornwall because we've been here before with lots of you know really powerful eloquent you know self-determining statements um you know there have been two big audits of public opinion recently the, the referendum and the last general election and some of what Cornwall said with that voice that isn't wholly consistent with with some of the, the the themes or the aspirations here so Brexit shared prosperity fund COVID its aftermath all these things are going to impact that the prevailing weather we've got a spending review coming up and a public sector pay freeze which I think will disproportionately hit Cornwall too um, and just more specific on a particular area the devolved adult skills um, yes that will be really good but again Cornwall's control over its own education has been diminishing since 2010. Cornish education could be run from Devon and even further afield, you know, now through to multi academy trusts and the control they have. So, again, it's just not losing sight of the fact that some of the national political prevailing weather will make some of this quite a challenge to deliver. But overall, as a statement, you know, I think it's very powerful and thank you very much. Thank you, thank Dave. You. I mean, I think you're right about the, the prevailing weather, and for me, that almost makes it more important. I don't want to underplay the challenges at all, um, but um, I do think it makes it all the more important that we've got a really, really um, kind of strong compass and sight through to the destination we want to get there because we know it's going to be, we're going to have some, some, as you say, some tough weather to navigate. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I think as well, it's a, this is a conversation, isn't it? And um, um, I think it will evolve um, and the conversations two ways as well. So it also uh, that, that sort of feedback of, you know, not just what the, the bottom up bit, but that feedback against the sort of prevailing winds as it were, will there'll be some tough decisions to make. And I think having this document is a very useful place to to start those. Um, but Mark, you've got Mark Goodwin. Yeah, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, Jesse. I think it's a great document and a huge thanks to you and the team for all of the work and the consultation that went into it. Um, I think the read across to the industrial strategy is really crucial and, and it's great to hear you emphasise that at the beginning. And I think this this kind of um, sets a platform for us as we re-examine the industrial strategy in a kind of post COVID post Brexit world. And I think it will be important that we continue to talk to each other as we do that. Um, 
just, just a point about transition four on um, equality, education and entrepreneurship. Um, it's great that you've linked all those three things. Um, I'm just wondering if you could if you if you could talk a bit more in there in a couple of sentences about the notion of a more kind of integrated education system in Cornwall that is that is kind of vertically integrated between schools, FE, HE and adult education as a way of making sure that you capture that link between equality education and entrepreneurship. It's it, it's kind of quite schools focused at the moment and just opening that into that wider education piece, I think would be helpful. Thank you, Mark. Um, we might pick up a flight because actually the um, I mean, if, if this is endorsed by all partners, um, uh, which it's it's on track for being, then um, then it will uh, help to shape and guide all the underpinning strategies and plans. And um, so I think that point you make will be a really, really important one to pick up across with our schools colleagues, as well as the skills um, board of the LEP um, and, and some of our further education institutions around how, how do we actually drive some of that and that integration point is, is a really valuable one. Just Jesse on the, uh, and this might be something to pick up with, uh, with Francis or Martin so might want to come in. So the ASB now includes uh, representatives from, um, sick, from schools, uh, from FE and HE. We've also got business coach, um, the representatives on there because we're quite conscious of adult skills, aging demographic, and 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 and. and. So that 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 board does have a sight of the right. breadth of skills required, and also sort of some very energetic people from each of those sectors. So we can that might be a useful way of joining up the dots and, and building on what uh, the point that Mark made. Uh, Francis, I don't know if you want to say any more about, about that. Yeah, I just I think the um, we deliberately set out to get a full perspective of business on the Employment and Skills Board, um, which is really fabulous. But what we have got is we've got a really, really energetic headmaster from Liscard School who has got a huge amount of drive and enthusiasm to work from the schools up and integrate activity right the way through to um, FE colleges um, and uh, universities, but also um, business representatives that are cross sectoral. So I, I'm hugely excited by the board and we want to do a little bit more about that later on. Um, but I think the thing for me with the strategies going forward is that the Cornwall we want to see, um, the amount of consultation work that you've done combined with the view from business will drive us far further forward. Um, and and you, I'd really commend the amount of work that you've done on this this paper and and how you've um, worked with all of the other industries. The only other thing I would say is that let me quite rightly raise the creative sector. We are in the process of co-opting some gaps, um, one of whom, um, which is the creative, one was construction and one was the hospitality and tourism. Um, again, we've managed to target some individuals that will add a huge amount of value to those areas. So yeah, please feel free to use us as a resource going forward because certainly when it comes to that demand side, I think we'll have a much clearer idea of what, what the county actually needs. Okay. Great, Francis, thank you very much. And I'd, I'd be really, I mean, you know, for me, um, endorsement of this vision uh, would be the starting point, not the end point for this work, actually, because it's then about how we deliver it. Um, so if, if you would find it helpful, I'd be really happy to join an ESB board discussion to, to, to focus on that and pick up some of the points that you and Mark have just, just made. OK, um, yeah, thank you, Francis. Um, any other, um, Linda, I don't know if it's a new hand or an old hand. Is that a sort of legacy or we? No, I think we lost Linda. Um, is there any other comments uh, or questions of it? And if I, I try to sum up what I've heard uh, and then please um, Please shout if I've heard the wrong thing. I haven't seen anything else. No, OK, so Jesse, um, I think from uh, Jesse is asking for us to um, note and endorse the vision. And I think what we're saying is that collectively um, that um, there is support of the vision, 
although recognizing that actually in some of the aspects of it needs some uh, more refining. Uh, so the, um, the economic focus and opportunity of the creative industries, uh, the, the wider importance of the cultural section, and we've sort of volunteered Emmy and no doubt other colleagues um, mm -hmm. to to um, to support you on that, um, uh, uh, Jesse. Uh, I would ask that we um, take some time to. Uh, I, I absolutely, absolutely, we need to nail the devolution aspect, but I think on the sustainable tourism, I, I think we need a bit more thinking. So, so I think direction is a yes, but we might want to refine that. Uh, and the other comment I had was working with the uh, the broader, the broader education, um, the, sorry, the broader education uh, agenda, which can be from young people coming through, but also the need needs of uh, in work and out of work, older colleagues and our aging demographics. So that sort of view, actually, we've all got a contribution to make to that, and um, using Francis's. Um, um, a team so to help you shape whatever the final words would be. Um, Francis put a hand up again, so I'm probably Francis. Just a mistake, Mike, Mark. I just need uh, to, yeah, play with the computer. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, so I think if if that's um, if that's a fair summary of that conversation. Um, um, can we, I think we agreed, we could, oh, hang on, sorry, we're multitasking here. Yeah, okay, but I, I think uh, Jesse's just on the chat, I tried to summarize so very few words in my waffle. Uh, so uh, approve the vision subject to agreeing amend to the cultural section, which will delegate to Emmy and, and take the creative, there might be some words around the creative elements of it. Um, I would actually ask to that we, um, we just note uh, the importance of devolution to deliver sustainable tourism ambitions, but we will work on the specific ask uh, and an, an intention to work with the Employment Skills Board to um, uh, to um, define, refine that ambition as we go on in terms of that document. So are people happy with that? Uh, and if they are, can I just ask that you put your hands up? I think is what we agreed. So if we can do that now. Thank you. I can confirm that that is, those recommendations have been carried. All right, Jesse. OK, thank you, well, thanks all. OK, well, thank you, Jesse. I hope that was helpful. I know there's an awful lot of work gone in before than, and during oh. that, um, and it will be a bit of a, a journey. But um, thank you. Thanks for joining the meeting. OK, lovely. Um, we're we're going to move on to um, I think Steve has now joined the, the, uh, the meeting, so if everyone can pop their hands down. And um, we'll pass on to uh, Steve and uh, Glenn to just pick up the work of the employment of the Enterprise Zone Board. Um, and Steve, it would be useful to pick up on on the energy agenda and floating off to a wind. Um, yeah. Uh, and I know the Enterprise um, Board has been um, uh, looking at the, uh, the the work that governments have uh, uh, been skated into Freeport. So it might be worth. If I can pass on to you two to introduce all that, and then we'll take the discussion from there. Sure. Do, do you want me to start, Glenn? Yeah, happy for you to start, Steve. And yeah, then sure. I'll pick up three ports. Yeah, yeah. What, what I'll do is I'll run down to three ports, throw that, and then let you pick, pick that up if I may. Um, I, I, if I may as well, Mark, I'll just give people 30 seconds update on floating offshore wind because it's relevant to the enterprise zone board, but things are also um, moving at speed. Um, the reason I've been struggling to actually make time for this particular board is that we're in the vinegar strokes of getting the sale of our uh, way pub, and that's going well. That's about as much as I can say in terms of commercial agreements. Uh, we're also in the vinegar strokes of submitting the strength in places. We did just to remind that six four million. Um, of which 34 million is grant funding is really to put the county and Plymouth in a position to build out from offshore in 2025 onwards. Uh, we're one of seven uh, contenders for this, just being through the list. And, uh, I think we're well placed, so I don't want to go over but we, uh, we think we've got a very strong, a strong ask, ask of that. Um, I think it's also perfectly timed as well for those of you who didn't hear the Prime Minister's Financial Times. It could not have been better timed for some of the things we're doing. So that's very, very encouraging. Um, 
it's uh, there is a lot going on in this hard work. Um, but the, the last thing that, that we've done uh, recently was that uh, with um, Mark and Glenn's support, I briefed the um, all of the Southwest LEPs. And I think it was the second November, Mark, and yeah. um, Minister Sahavi was in that. Uh, we pitched to him to say that essentially that the government's ambition for the offshore was too small, uh, that, that based on our experience, currently with some KPMG as we're looking around the world about who wants to buy where we are, um, that actually we need bigger ambition. So at the moment the government's ambition is one gigawatt of floating offshore wind uh, between now and 2030, which would give us, if you take out the existing uh, pipeline, that would give us one 300 megawatt project, Scotland one 300 megawatt project, and that's not what the market is. So we've actually pitched for six gigawatts um, and uh, that was in a letter, sorry, in a ministerial submission, which was pretty much along the lines of the one that we did uh, as part of two years ago to Claire Perry, but this time to Mrs. Harwee. Uh, Mrs. Harwee is the industry minister, I suppose, the energy side of Bayes. And what's interesting is that Bayes is a amalgamation of deck and biz, as was. And that if you talk to insiders, then if Josie's on the on the call, which they'll often say that that sometimes the two don't talk. So I'm quite pleased that we've pitched this to to um, the, the the industrial side because actually we're making a very strong industrial case for the potential in terms of jobs, uh, uh, economic growth, development, and the securing of a uh, a large uh, uh, industry um, for the region. So that's the context, really. Um, jumping into um, the, the um, enterprise zone, I think the, the, we had a very good um, visit to AMP um, about, about a week and a half ago, actually. That was an on-site visit, and uh, that was very encouraging. We had a look at their plans as well in terms of what they're trying to do and what they're seeking. I don't want to go too much into the detail of that, other than to say that um, they're very well aligned uh, with um, uh, what we're seeking to do, um, both in the enterprise zones, but more broadly in the industry. So um, I had a couple of aerospace engagements as well, but I think probably, the, and, and I think it would be fair to say that generally speaking, things are going reasonably well in the enterprise zone board. The, there's the outstanding issue of the um, short notice transfer of funds so that we could uh, hit other priorities. And the, the key key ones of those have really been spent. So that's physical, Chamber of Commerce and Cornwall Marine Network. I really, um, it's now we're sort of sat back, uh, waiting to sort of probably make decisions about what we do with those funds, whether we return them or whether we we hold them pending other other requests. But I think that's watch the space. But I think the most exciting thing that's happened is the uh, free ports and um, the free port work that's been done. I'll just start this, but then let uh, Glenn finish. is is interesting, and the idea really is the is the potential to create either a free port either at uh, Arbus or at uh, UK or both in a sort of hub and spoke arrangement uh, with the pitch being either one of floating offshore wind or space or both. Um, the work that's been done is is encouraging. It's almost a no-brainer. Um, talking to Ian Mackerworth about just this thing, it's almost a no-brainer given the advantages that are, are in for the, uh, the owners of the free port. But um, Glenn, shall I um, stop there and then let you talk about yeah. yourself? Can, can yeah. I just a couple of quick things before we, Glenn, just before yes, we uh, just, uh, just just very quick, very, very quickly, just to say that Mr. Sahawi, um, in addition to the floating offshore wind, also asked for a paper on the um, Benjamin uh, rollout, which is the methane capture from slurry pits, which um, uh, which which is another again Cornish business um, going forward. So that was. Um, that was hugely helpful and um, the announcements this week um, about the clean recovery clearly finished. I had a cancer from ground source heat pump that was featured on the main spotlight TV. So there's a quite a bit of um, uh, um, uh, media focus and interest, uh, government interest in what Cornwall can do. To that point at the beginning of my, uh, I think my summary is that we just need to get that, uh, you know, that evidence when it's not just a devolved nation. Uh, and I think the other briefing we, we're giving um, Steve, hopefully, is Andrew Griffith, who yeah. um, who was a PM's advisor, but he's now, minister, he's now an MP down in Arundel, but he's the COP26 net zero, I can't remember, it's not Czar, is it Lead? 
So yeah. that's somebody we met when we were talking about Great South West. So we're also going to feed into him to accelerate hopefully this whole agenda. Yeah, that, that Mr. Sahawi paper has gone to him and uh, we're, we're going to look at one or two other people. It's gone to all the Cornish MPs and Lords, but also we'll look at one or two others. I know that um, DIT will be interested and there are there are officials within base who are also interested in the paper. We just wanted to let it settle into the minister's office and give them the time before it was circulated elsewhere. Lovely, perfect. Um, sorry, Glenn, uh, Glenn, I'll pass over. Thanks, Mark. I was just going to pick up on some of the detail of the the, the Freeport um, proposition that's been emerging over the last couple of weeks and probably isn't captured in this report because what we've had land in the last um, kind of five, ten days is two things. One is the government's very detailed criteria on what they're looking for, uh, for Freeport bids and the timescale for that and some of the policy and delivery issues around that. It's a very long document. It came out this week and we're still going through that in some detail. Uh, but board members will also remember um, that in, in anticipation of that uh, and building on the good work that partners have done locally on the enterprise zone, we did commission an independent piece of work to advise us on what the um, kind of a potential Cornwall and Sully bid might look like, whether we had a credible proposition. And that report, helpfully, has also landed this week. Uh, the Enterprise Zone Board have seen a draft of it, and we will certainly circulate it um, to partners and, and the LEP board more widely. Um, I, I'll try and summarise that report. Uh, Steve will have a view about whether I've summarised it accurately. I think what that report says is that we have a credible proposition. That proposition is um, most likely to be successful based around combining the natural assets uh, and port side facilities of Falmouth docks with um, uh, Cornwall Airport, Newquay, potentially linked to the spaceport because that allows us to do two things which are important in the criteria. Um, one is speak to an innovation agenda, so flow, space, aerospace, um, but secondly, um, also build on the enterprise zone uh, that we already have. Uh, on a more kind of negative sense, the report does flag up that our uh, proposition, if it is based on that, will probably be um, much smaller in scale than other areas around the country, both in terms of uh, potential outputs at a national level uh, and in meters squared. So the, there are pros and cons, but overall uh, the report from the consultant said there was something worth considering uh, and, and that we should probably do some more work on that proposition. Um, we'll test that against the criteria which was published straight afterwards, but we think that's a reasonably accurate assessment. However, I think th th I don't think this will come as a surprise to anyone because it has been um, Cornwall Council uh, cabinet portfolio holder for a little while now, certainly um, in Bob's time. And, and I think Tim will speak for himself, but I think also more recently with the cabinet, I think Cornwall Council cabinet are not keen to progress with a Freeport proposition that includes council assets. So the next stage, I think, for uh, me as LEP Chief Exec is to test that with Cornwall Council in the light of the published guidance and the report we've had. Uh, and then also, if that is the case, have a conversation with partners, AMP, Falmouth Harbour Commission, about whether a standalone bid uh, would be compelling enough to, to, to put the effort in and, and work on. So my plan is to share the report on Freeport's a bit more widely, it's only just in, um, and seek some clarity on Cornwall Council's position and then come back to the board with a recommendation of through the enterprise zone of whether to bid uh, or not based on the partners we've got engaged. And just for clarity, um, there's clearly things are happening really quickly politically with um, with focus on free ports, but am I, am I right in thinking that the ambition from the UK is to have 10 and it'll be a competitive tender? Um, is, is that still correct? Yeah, that's right, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Josie might have a view on that and the, and the, the guidelines as well, and, and correct me if I've got anything wrong, um, but I certainly think um, from a LEP point of view, it's worth investigating further with private sector partners. 
I think it's, it's seven for England is the figure I've got in my mind. There's probably 10, 10 nationally, mm -hmm. 10, 10, in, 10 in the nations. Yeah. So um, it's sort of, we're sort of back into the, um, the growth deal type competitive um, opportunity. So there's two things I guess from this is, is one, have we got a compelling argument based on our future, uh, our future aspirations for our local industrial strategy and have we got key partner support? So is it practically deliverable? And the other thing is that if we are going to be, uh, if it's going to be overwhelmed by submissions from across uh, the UK, uh, is, there, is there an argument in terms of um, uh, signaling our ambition uh, to, in this respect? So I know we've got some hands up. So um, if I sort of take comments, is, is I'm, and I, forgive me, I think Tim went up before Linda, but Tim, Linda, got comments either this or the um, or the work of the enterprise zone. Uh, so Tim first, maybe. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to give an update quickly on cabinet's position. Um, broadly, uh, we are still in the position Bob was in, which is not to. Uh, do support on our own land. In particular, in the current climate, the airport is all about saving the airport. That's our priority. Um, anything else could be a distraction. <clears throat> and also from a climate change emergency point of view, having additional um, planes arriving uh, is not something we're keen to um, promote. Um, but uh, as a let board member, obviously more than happy to look at what you um, uh, want to come up with in terms of Falmouth. Uh, my, my own personal sense is that that would be better. Um, but I, I think what Steve's been saying is very important. This is a deeply competitive process um, and uh, the scale that government will be looking for, in my opinion anyway, is going to be probably bigger than what we can cope with anyway. However, um, you know, if Falmouth, the docks went for it, um, obviously um, that that's up to them. And so there we go. That's that's the update. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, and appreciate that um, that, that you and Linda have got two hats in in all of this. So, um, Linda, do you want to come in next? Um, I wanted to thank Steve. Um, Steve knows I'm a huge fan of what he's doing. I particularly like the enthusiasm and the deliverability of, of, of his particular project. So once again, Steve, thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased that the LEPA perhaps considering a standalone bid. Uh, I just think the, the excitement of a free, um, free ports are tremendously exciting for Cornwall. I particularly like the fact, you know, that this could be this opportunity to turbo charge, drive investment and create jobs. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how the LEP are going to be dealing with this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Linda. And if guys could take your hands down when you, when you stop so you don't confuse me. I think the other thing is um, that it, wherever this um, piece of work ends up, this is going to be based on the future opportunity of, um, of Cornwall. So the scale now is undoubtedly tiny compared to is what Cornwall could be for UK PLC. So in itself, this is going to reinforce our our list credentials, be it around clean growth, uh, energy, um, space, whatever. Are there any other comments from people on, um, on not just free ports, but on the Progress Enterprise Zone Board and um, the energy discussion generally? So um, there's no new hands on it. So I think what we'll do is we, we will let this, uh, as, as Glenn suggests, we need to let this piece of work um, settle down and that we will bring it back to um, back to the board through the Enterprise Zone Board to um, for us to discuss and agree where, where we set as, um, as let partners in that. But um, if there's nothing else on the Enterprise Zone Board, um, thank you. And uh, thank you through uh, Steve, the board for all. We um, we did divert some funds to make sure some of our representative groups, aside from um, um, from the LEP, uh, were able to function through COVID, and um, I'm, I'm so glad we did so. So that, that's the right decision. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. We might lose Steve. Um, we've got uh, any other business? I was going to suggest we do any other business and then just take a, a quick um, comfort break. But I didn't know, John, um, if you want to just update your landmark on COISA because we haven't got to it in our discussion so far. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, 
yeah, just to say on Koisif, um, it's uh, it's now two years um, <clears throat> since Koisif was uh, was launched. Uh, it's a forty million pound fund, and uh, roughly speaking, it's intended to be invested in Cornish and Isles of Scilly businesses um, in terms of both equity and uh, and debt and. Uh, we had an independent um, uh, report done uh, recently, and this was commissioned by British Business Bank, um, partly because it, it is two years and uh, we've uh, managed to uh, invest and lend uh, te over 10 million pounds now to, uh, to to local businesses. And um, it was it was a good uh, a good report for us in that it, uh, it recognized that we are changing attitudes to uh, particularly equity finance, which uh, I think Cornwall historically has, uh, uh, let's call it underperformed, i.e. done less than uh, than the rest of the country. And also uh, it's, it's, been, it's been very good in terms of job creation and uh, productivity improvement. So, um, and I think the other key factor, and this has obviously happened since COVID, is we've had the uh, sectors um, um, relax so that uh, we can now more or less uh, invest or lend to to any any business so i almost think that i would like to think that uh, we can actually and, and this could could become more relevant over the next few months uh, help uh, uh, struggling businesses which obviously are um, going to be let's say post covid type successful businesses but are struggling at the moment so that's that's, I think, a real opportunity for us to uh, to minimise uh, uh, the damage that um, that COVID is uh, COVID is doing. Um, I think that's all really I want to uh, I want to say, uh, Mark, on, on on the investment fund. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, and thank you for your work on that. And I think it's um, because of the success that you're getting so far at the university. You know, there's, there's ideas being muted around, um, you know, whether this sort of fund could play a part in, you know, evolving our tourism offer. Um, so um, not only important in its own right, but actually um, um, starting to sort of generate some conversations as well outside us, like where it could go, get some evolving funds that will come back into Cornwall. Um, yeah, I think, can I, can I just say, it's, yeah. it, it is probably worth mentioning, and I am spending quite a bit of time on this, that, that there is a, a sort of national um, uh, move, if you like, and this is outside of government, uh, to uh, to set up uh, regional sustainable funding uh, for the for the post-COVID situation, i.e. climate change, etc. And um, um, I mean, one of the key interesting phrases I, I saw on this was that, uh, you know, this this will happen, um, not because of government, but in spite of government. So there's a real private sector focus on this because it's all tied in with uh, impact reporting, which uh, is um, is going to I think ultimately go into businesses alongside uh, financial reporting to, to, to recognize the fact that um, businesses have to uh, uh, have to play their part in terms of um, the, the, the net zero objectives and and this is <clears throat> gaining quite a lot of momentum uh, really across the private sector and uh, um, it's, it's obviously somewhere away but it, it, it is going to come and as I say alongside that could be regional funds and we're the only regional fund at a smaller scale uh, outside of the uh, Northern Powerhouse and Midlands Engine Fund. So um, we are ideally placed to, I think, play, play a leading part in this uh, in this shift. Yeah, uh, which um, I think in all the future devolution conversations, I know we've lost Jesse now, is something we must keep reminding people of our particular skill set here. Um, I, I, I know Glenn's just put his hand up. The other, we'll just quiz around uh, any other business. We've lost Steve, but he wanted to raise. We we did have, um, with his energy pat on, we did have an engagement uh, call with Steve Tare and myself, which he seemed to do. I have to say, it was the only disrespectful position in the group, probably the only left meeting ever had put Tim Hatton in for. Uh, but it was an extremely useful meeting we had with, um, uh, with uh, Move Back and Bake On. And so we are now through Claire Brewer group, but also the energy group. Um, 
set to rise into school, which hasn't been as easy to get to in the past. Um, Glenn, let's end up. Yeah, sorry, Mark, you were getting, uh, I think you covered mainly what I was going to say around. Um, I was going to say two things. One was uh, thanks to John for all the um, guidance and uh, work he's put into making the investment fund a success. I think he's played a really key role uh, in chairing the board uh, and getting that moving. Uh, so, so many thanks from an exec point of view to John. And also I was just going to make the point about um, this is one of the few um, regional investment schemes in the country. It does put us around the same table as Northern Powerhouse, Midlands Engine, uh, Wales in terms of de devolved administrations. So this is a great example of um, Cornwall and Scilly uh, getting a, a, a program up and running, taking a strategic lead uh, and as time goes on increasingly delivering on it. So I just wanted to, to say this is probably uh, one of those things we would use as evidence um, to be making a, a difference to businesses on the ground, but also um, leading the way nationally as well. And I think the other thing which uh, thanks to John and uh, we also have the British Business Bank who is working with John um, on our business course. So it's also mindful it's an opportunity of feeding back to them to the people they might be talking to in the government what's um, what the economy of will look like in the years because uh, they're going to lose it to the um, structure of this um, of investment before it's been like different down here. So um, yeah, just one of those conversations that work both ways. Um, any other comments? Um, or any other business, um, or people happy to have a quick comfort break, five minutes, and then we'll come back and do the part two. Brilliant. Okay, so um, if um, Emma, um, if you just guide us through how you'd like us to take this comfort break and uh, not lose signal and, and not dissolve the meeting, that would be really helpful. And then we'll, uh, we'll adjourn just for a few minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's Emma Code. Um, it, the live stream will now be turned off. Um, so once I get confirmation, I'll let you all know. It's